Okay, I'd like to call to order this meeting of the first five Sacramento Commission for Monday, October 2nd, 2023. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll and establish a quorum? Yes, sir. Chair Serna. Here. Commissioner Wesley. Commissioner Fernandez E. Garcia? Here. Commissioner Gordon? Here. Commissioner Casserie? She is not here. Uh, Commissioner Katari? Here. And Commissioner Wirtz? Here. Commissioner Kennedy? Is not. Commissioner Hassett? Here. Uh, Commissioner Turner Johnson is out today. <laughs> Commissioner Evans? Here. Commissioner Gross? Here. Commissioner KAS is not here today. And Commissioner Moak. Here. Thank you. Yes, we have a quorum. Very good. Would you please rise and join me in the pledge? <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, before our clerk uh, reads the statement that she needs to read, I want to welcome Lawanda Wesley to the dais. This is her first, first five Sacramento Commission meeting, and we look forward to um, you actively participating. And this is a good group of folks I think you'll find, and uh, really uh, want to welcome, welcome you. So with that, Madam Clerk. Uh, this meeting of the First Five Sacra Sacramento Commission is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the go local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and the AT&T U-verse cable systems. This meeting is closed captioned and live streamed at metro14live.sacccounty.gov. Today's meeting replays Friday, October 6th at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. This meeting can also be viewed at youtube.com slash metrocable14. Very good. Thank you. Again, I just want to welcome those that are joined us here in chambers and remind folks that you're certainly welcome to address the commission on any item on our published agenda and any item that is not on our agenda. We simply ask that you please... Uh, bring to the clerk's attention um, a speaker request form, and we will call you in the order that those reforms are received. So with that, let's move on to our business this afternoon. Uh, first item is approval of the August 7th draft action summary. Any uh, member of the commission wish, wish to pull the uh, draft action summary or have comments? If not, I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Okay, it's been uh, moved by Commissioner Wirtz. The chair will second. And do we need to, we need to do roll call vote, right? Correct. Chair Serna. Aye. Commissioner Wesley. Aye. Commissioner Fernandez E. Garcia. Aye. Commissioner Gordon. Aye. Commissioner Gross. Aye. Commissioner Katari. Aye. Commissioner Wirtz. Aye. Thank you, motion passes. And I assume, Madam Clerk, that we didn't have any members of the public sign up to speak on. Correct, we do not. Okay, very good. Then on to separate matters. Uh, next item, please. Um, <clears throat> item number two is public con comments of off agenda items. I know we had uh, three folks just join us in the chamber. You're welcome to address the commission on uh, any item that's on the agenda or not on the agenda. Uh, we ask that you please fill out a speaker slip but I do not see anyone approaching the podium or our <laughs> clerk, so I will assume that there are no off-agenda comments. They're here for a specific item. Okay, Okay. Less. very good. Okay. All right, next item, please. Item number three is the executive director's report. Good afternoon, good commissioners. Afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to share a couple items from the executive director's report. I wanted to start with uh, Parent Leadership Training Institute. We are currently uh, recruiting for our next two cohorts. Excited about that. We have extended the application deadline to October 23rd, so plenty of time to get the word out still. We're especially looking for Spanish language participants, um, so if you have someone in mind, please send them our way. Um, also, we will be presenting PLTI as part of a larger workshop at the upcoming, at the county's upcoming 
uh, Racial Equity Summit later this month. So we were accepted to have a workshop uh, which is titled Advancing Racial Equity Through Parent Partnerships. Um, Alejandra Labrado and a couple of our fellow PLTI members, including I believe Jennifer Muhammad, is here in the audience, is going to be presenting. Um, so if you get the opportunity to attend, it's a two-day summit. Most of the workshops are on day one, and the second day is more of a networking um, uh, day. So October 18th, and I did send the link for registration in email, but I can follow up again if you're interested, because it's I think it's going to be really spectacular. Uh, it's sort of our inaugural summit to launch all of the racial equity work that the county is doing right now. And that's at Sac State, correct? It is at Sac State. It's a free it's a free summit, and there's free parking, and some snacks, but lunch is on your own. <laughs> okay. Um, in other news, uh, if we've been quiet lately, it's because we've all been really working hard to get our RFPs, Qs, and As out the door. Um, we had just released the first set. We have another round coming in October and another round in December. Um, and then actually all the racial equity uh, uh, targeted funding comes out next year um, after doing some participatory interviews, focus groups, and getting feedback from providers and community on what's really needed and wanted with those dollars. So, um, yes, we hope to, well, we will be bringing you <laughs> for your approval starting early next year some of those um, uh, funding recommendations, both for competitive and non-competitive. I wanted to give a brief update on uh, our racial equity, diversity, and inclusion work. Um, it's been more than two years since uh, this commission uh, approved its resolution on racial equity and social justice. And we've been working uh, diligently um, to really create an anti-racist agency at the commission. Um, part of that work has been bringing our advisory committee along on that journey with us. Um, and we have uh, been having really sort of profound conversations, discussions at the advisory committee, um, acknowledging some harm had been done at that committee, and working to ensure that, that there's a safe space for discussions, acknowledging when harm is done, and, um, and really moving the whole group forward. One of the things we did at our last meeting was um, take the time, a huge chunk of the time, just to discuss um, what this looks like in our committee. And we had um, a, s a set of agreements that the committee agreed upon about how they want to operate within um, that group. And then they requested to create a value statement that would be sort of their, their like North Star around how they um, how they want to interact with each other in order to really fulfill their purpose. Their purpose is to advise the, this commission, and they wanted to be able to talk about that in a value statement. So we're working on all of those things right now. Our next meeting is in October, and I'm really excited uh, can report back to you on what those final agreements and the value statement that they reach looks like. Um, we're also documenting that whole process, working with our consultants, um, because it's been such a learning experience, and I think many other commissions across the state who have um, advisory committees and are also working on their racial equity, um, on, their, on their journey, uh, can really learn from what's happening at our own advisory committee. So we're working to really track how we've progressed and what steps we've taken and um, all that stuff and to share it statewide with others. So really cool stuff happening at advisory committee. Um, another thing that is launching this week 
is, or this month is um, First Five Association has a Medi-Cal learning community. So with the launch of CalAIM um, and all these new benefits rolling out and all the First Fives are kind of really paying attention, we need to get educated ourselves on how we can interact with our managed care plans and how our providers could potentially interact with our managed care plans in order to leverage as much money as possible. Uh, especially as our money is decreasing, how can others come on and, and how can we use some of those dollars to really offset our losses and make sure that uh, our services don't decrease locally for families. Two more things, because um, I have the time today because we have a short agenda. <laughs> um, the City of Sacramento's Children's Fund, I just wanted to give you a brief update on that. So that was uh, with the passage of Measure L, they, are, they have um, established a commission, an oversight commission for that group that will um, direct the city on how to spend about $8 million per year on services for children. And um, we, along with Youth Forward, have, uh, are going to get ready to convene our second, or do our second convening of early childhood experts across a variety of uh, different subject matter areas um, and bring them together so that we can provide recommendations to the Oversight Commission on what funding could look like for our youngest city's residents. Acknowledging what we're already funding, what, we're cut, we, what cuts First Five has had to make, how you know, we really want to make sure we're not duplicating anything with the city and that. Um, if possible, the city could even step in and fund where First Five is pulling away. So to do that in an organized way. So um, that meeting, the next one is on October 24th, and I will follow up with this commission meeting with an email to say, if anybody wants to attend that meeting, um, you're very welcome to do so. And then one item that's not in the report but is exciting and wanted to give you an update on is that today is the launch of our new closed loop referral system that we've built out in Persimony Data Management System. So this commission and especially our evaluation committee has really been focused since we adopted our results-based accountability evaluation framework. We've really been focused on looking at outcomes like is anybody better off from the services that we've been funding? Um, and with this new referral portal, we will be able to track all referrals that were given, um, go into the system, and allows that referral to be immediately sent via email to the referring agency, who can then pick up that email provide a service and, and it respond in the system and then the agency that provided the service, that, that provided the referral will know that the service was done, that the family received the service. This is really different from how we've been collecting referral data. We've just been throwing, you know, thousands of referrals have been going in, but we haven't been able to say what it means how many families got what services and what kind of services did they receive and was where were the issues if they didn't get services, what were the barriers? So I am really excited about this sort of warm handoff, the systems change for us and being able to um, track where those services are and who's getting them. Um, and I think it's really going to be helpful from just a, a data management perspective, those data entry staff at our funded program, at our funded agencies are often so overwhelmed with the amount of data. So just being very intentional about not collecting data for the sake of data's sake, but just for, co for collecting and using the data to better understand what we're doing. So that is exciting. It launches today and when I come back a year from now and we talk about our annual report, we should actually be able to tell you some information about all those referrals. So exciting. And that concludes my executive director's report. Very good. Thank you, Julie. Yes. Commissioner Wirtz. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, three questions I have for you. One's a simple one. Um, I was reading over the RFPs, and some have mandatory letters, some have mandatory bidding uh, meetings, and some seem to just have letters. So is there any, uh, or what is the logic? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. So some of them that require the mandatory letters are more around our competitive processes because we're very interested in who might be applying um, for the funding. The, the non-competitive uh, request for applications, those have, uh, we have sort of justified and put a rationale for why those would not have to be competitive. And so with those, we already know who's going to be applying because they were the only ones who were able to apply. Uh, I thought of the of the competitive ones, there was, um, uh, let's see, I don't have, uh, I think I have my, the pregnancy one seemed to have a mandatory meeting and letter, but the family um, engagement seemed to only have a letter for the school districts. And then the play group and the parent cafe didn't seem to have any requirements. So, uh, yes. Um, so for the play groups and the community engagements at the schools, it is because the districts were already selected and so it, 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 okay. it is still non-competitive. Got it, okay. Yeah. And, and the oral health has a mandatory letter. It does, and that one is a competitive RFP for systems improvement, our very first okay. <laughs> systems improvement uh, competitive RFP. Uh, thank you. That, that was yeah. just trying to figure that out myself. Um, just a comment on the advisory committee's efforts. I, I know the racial equity discussions for many people be turn into a very difficult conversation. So I, th I applaud you for the, for the effort to work through that and to do that in a respectful and, and appropriate manner. So I, I, I know how difficult those kind of conversations can be, um, having some experience with that. Um, and then finally, just with the closed loop referrals, as you know, the evaluation committee has been looking at that for a long time. And I'm really pleased to hear that we're to the point that we um, will have a way to, to look at the success of our referrals. I know our providers do uh, lots of good referrals. And the question is, how do we help our families take advantage of those? And I think this will help to do this. And again, for me, it's never been about the data. Uh, right. It's about whether or not our families are connected in terms of the services they need. So I think it serves, hopefully it serves that function first and foremost, and then hopefully our evaluation is a way to be able to see that that's what's happening. So yeah. thank you for that effort. I know it's not easy, and I know we had, we have Unite Us and Persimony as different models, and yes. uh, but I'm glad that Persimony has a version now that we can... Uh, use and hopefully we'll monitor its effectiveness and um, see how well it helps us serve our families. Yes, absolutely. We did put out Unite Us as an option, but um, a, a, quite a few of the providers felt that staying within our own Persimony system was would be better for them, and so that's why we developed it within Persimony. And I guess just the final point the, about the um, consent forms um, issue. Um, I'm hoping that our legal counsel is is working with us around ensuring that um, that we see that this is part of the service system. It's not for da data collection per se. It's part of how do we provide our families with the services they need. And hopefully we can get that. You know, if there's any issues around that, that it's clear that it's not. It's not research, it's not evaluation, it's services. Um, and how do we ensure that we get services? So hopefully it's part of uh, understanding that that's what people are signing when they sign up for any kind of services. They're signing up for that kind of system of care. So hopefully that's not an issue. And please let us know if it is. Yeah, I will. Commissioner Katari. Yeah, thank you. Lots of exciting work going on at First Five, so thank you for that report. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things. One is, with regards to SB 326 and MHSA modernization, we are pulling together a working group to look at how that funding is going to flow and how we need to make some adaptations in the county. So I will definitely include you or whoever you to designate that. to that. 
Also with Cal AIM, I know DHS is taking some leadership, Department of Health Services taking some leadership on really looking at how Cal AIM rolls out with, in partnership with our managed care plan. So if you'd like, Julie, I can also link you um, to the team that's working on that. And then I just wanted to also just echo what Commissioner Wirtz was saying in terms of that closed loop referral and the importance of tracking data in that way. And we're, we're being asked to really look at that across all of our programs. It's not specific to first five, but because the data is much more important because we know oftentimes we refer families who then never make it if we don't have the correct warm handoffs and whatnot. In relationship to that, the board's invested a lot of money in the social health information exchange, which is going to be our community information exchange. And as a result of the process that we're going through, we're gonna be talking a lot over this next year on releases of information, universal release forms. How do we tie not only the data together, but our our ability to work across systems together on behalf of the, the youth and the families that we serve. And so, once again, I'll ensure that you stay looped or your team stays looped on those discussions because I think they're going to be um, really getting off underway here very soon and it's going to result in some really good um, collaborative work on behalf of our families. So, thanks. Love to hear that. It's one of the benefits of this First Five Commission being a part of the larger county is that we have those connections and um, and you can make them for us. So thank you for doing that. Commissioner Gross. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to note for everybody here and anybody watching this, uh, that when we say Spanish language cohort for PLTI, it's le learning in Spanish, but it doesn't have to be people who only speak Spanish. We are now really hoping that we get some bilingual English and Spanish speakers who are happy to learn in Spanish, but who can also help their fellow parent leaders in the cohort to access English language materials. And so when you think about who do I know who, who might wanna do that, also include the people who are bilingual, but who could learn in Spanish with us. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. Commissioner Wesley. Hi everyone, hi Julie. Hi. I'm excited about um, your new database system that will look at closing the loop. Um, Child Care Resource Center is actually holding a statewide convening um, next month that will bring together Department, De uh, Department of Developmental Services, Department of Social Services, California Department of Education on that very same thing, looking at how we make sure thousands and ten thousands of kids who are in, in receiving subsidized child care aren't falling through their loop knowing that folk, our children and families who are in, in Head Start um, or in other programs where they're receiving comprehensive services, you know, from eye vision to um, speech services and all of that good stuff. So we're looking at using ASQs and Help Me Grow. And as some may or may not know, I was a mom who received subsidy for my five children as a single mother. And I could have used those services right away when I came to Sacramento County. Eventually we got settled in, but it took a while. So my kids did end up needing um, speech services in elementary, but if we could have gotten those services early on, it could have mitigated a lot. So I'll share that brief report. Thank you. Just highlights tidbits with you when we come back together. Perfect, thank you. Commissioner Wirtz. Thank you, sorry, just another question. I was really excited to read, but I would like to see if you could say something more about the MHSA expansion to zero to five. Um, I know in the early planning years of that, there was, I, it was very hard to argue for prevention of mental health issues, which as a developmental psychologist, I'm convinced that most mental health can be prevented, not treated or early intervened, but prevented. So is this, a, is this really a, a change of focus around how uh, mental health is going to be perceived in terms of primary prevention? Um, what, what it represents is when the whole revise is happening with mm -hmm. the Prop 63, the governor's revisions, um, there had been very little focus on prevention at all right. across any age range. Um, and getting the early childhood mental health services language into it was the result of a lot of advocacy from this commission and many commissions across the state um, really working with the administration to kind of share why we would want to call out early child mental health as a service. 
um, as, as a fundable um, you know, category of service. They didn't go so far as to say, we're going to allocate this much money for early child mental health, but, but they did say we're, it's from birth all the way through 24, 26 years old. Um, we took it as a win, and, and it's an, it was like a scary time. Even our county behavioral health services right now funds a really important program through Child Action and SCOE, um, which provides a behavioral health specialist for child care providers. So when a child is having an issue, acting out, biting, and, and a child care provider might think, I have to, I have to cut this child out of my program, mm -hmm. um, they can call, and this is a collaborative partnership between First Five and Behavioral Health Services. Um, so we didn't even know if that funding was going to be allowed to stay if we, when we talk about there's a lot of demand for those prevention dollars, and now they're going to be cut. So keeping that language in there, I think, was our win for us, but we are still really kind of worried <laughs> about what that redesign is going to look like, which is why I'm, thank you, Commissioner Katari, for inviting me to, to participate in that table at the county. I appreciate that. Uh, just add safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments are preventive for mental health. Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Gordon. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to add, as, as a member of the Mental Health Services Commission, uh, we have been talking over the last seven, eight years about, number one, the notion that we focus way too much on treatment and way too little on prevention. Uh, number two, that we need to build the, br bring the education and the child development systems much closer together with the, um, the health systems in order to do exactly that, to, f to begin to focus on, on prevention. The, the original uh, MHSA Act talked about prevention of school failure. Well, prevention of school failure be begins in the zero to five space, right. not when, when children show up as four-year-olds and, and five-year-olds. Yeah. And, and I just wanted to give a shout out to this county has embraced that notion in a major way where we're posting mental health clinicians in the schools yeah. to become part of the fabric of the understanding of what the role of schools and health services can be together. And we've, we've gotten great support from, from Siobhan and her team, from our, from our supervisors. Uh, and also from the, uh, the, governor's, the, uh, the governor's plan and the and the the managed care plans have have been very very cooperative. So I'm very very optimistic about where where this can head, and and really optimistic about being able to drive more prevention services down into the the zero to five space, and and have our have our schools and our child care agencies help with doing that and be a part of it. So. So kudos to uh, kudos to Sacramento <laughs> County. It's it's been an amazing partnership, and and the uh, the managed care plans. Yep. Thanks to you, David, for for being a great partner and advocate too. Commissioner Fernandez de Garcia. Yeah, and I'll also say that um, our commission, I think, is uh, uniquely positioned to remind folks that. Um, Mental, mental health conditions can be intergenerational. Yeah. And often when we're treating adults, parents, we are preventing mental health conditions in children. Right. And that we, like I said, are in a special position to remind folks that families are a unit and that everything that we do has impacts on other people in the family. So I just, you know, while it is true that we do focus on treatment, at least in this case, treating parents yes. is a form of prevention. So the, all the things that we do in our, uh, in First Five that links families to support services, to treatment services, is as important as what we do to link children to those children's okay. services. So thanks for always keeping that in mind Absolutely. when we do what we do. It's the first five motto is it's the whole child and the whole family because we know young children do not operate in a world outside of their parents. 
Okay, all great comments and contributions from the commission. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have anyone signed up to speak on the executive director's report? No, sir, we do not. Okay, very good. Thank you, Julie. Okay. All right, next item, please. Item number four is the advisory committee update from August 11th, 2023, and also to appoint Maria Lopez to the member at large seat, a child care provider and new mother. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I talked mostly, already covered uh, what we did at our last meeting during my executive director's report, but I'm very pleased to bring forward a recommendation to appoint Maria Lopez. Um, she is a PLTI participant from the first cohort um, and runs a family child care uh, in Natomas, a bilingual family child care. So I think she'll, she'll bring some great perspective and she is ready to jump in and go. All right, very good. Any comments from commissioners? Uh, the chair will move the appointment of Maria Lopez. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Wirtz. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone signed up to speak on this item? No, sir, we do not. Okay, roll call vote, please. Chair Serna. Aye. Commissioner Wesley. Aye. Commissioner Fernandez E. Garcia. Aye. Commissioner Gordon. Aye. Commissioner Casirie. Aye. Commissioner Katari. Aye. Commissioner Wirtz. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Very good. Congratulations to Ms. Lopez. All right. Next item, please. Next item is an evaluation committee update. Uh, thank you. Um, the evaluation committee did not have a meeting on September 18th. We uh, punted to our optional October 16th date. So we will be uh, having our next meeting on the 16th. Very good, thank you. Anyone sign up to speak on this item? No, sir, we do not. All right, very good. Next item, please. Item number six, financial planning committee update. We did not meet. <laughs> Short and sweet. All right, very good. Anyone uh, sign up to speak on this matter? No. All right, next item, please. Item number seven, systems optimization and sustainability committee update. Good afternoon, Commission. Now, the SOS committee held a regular scheduled meeting on August 15th, 2023. Committee members received highlights of the 2023-2024 state budget and the status of Prop 10 revenues following the flavor ban on tobacco. Uh, members learned about collaborative partnerships with Smile California and the Sacramento Business Journal around dental access and DEI in the workplace. Uh, this year's scope of work for Pure Genius Consulting was reviewed as well as FRP's language around sustainability and racial equity. And our next meeting is scheduled for October 17th. In absence of appointing a committee chair, commissioners serving on the committee will rotate duties moving forward. That is the end of my report. Very good. Thank you. Anyone time to speak on this item? Not on this one, no. All right. Next item, please. Item number eight. Approval to enter into a revenue agreement with Sacramento County Department of Public Health to provide oversight and funding for refugee family support services from October 2nd, 2023 through May 31st, 2024, and to execute second amendments to increase the funding allocations for five existing RFS contractors. And one thing to note, we have two recusals, and so that will only have six voting members on this item. Okay, Dr. Kassiri, I assume you're one of the recusals, as is uh, Commissioner Katari. So we'll give you a moment to um, step away from the dais. And we'll call you back in when we're done. I just wanted to make one comment about the board item before I leave, which is um, the Department of Public Health needs to probably be amended. Department of Health Services is the legal name. Department, uh, Division of Public Health is the division under the department. Thank you. And I will recuse myself. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, over the last year, we've had the honor of working with five agencies that serve refugee populations, four of which that we have never partnered with before, um, thanks to funding by First Five California. Um, these agencies are the Muslim American Society, Social Services Foundation, the Refugee Enrichment Development Association, 
Mutual Assistance Network, Public Health Institute, and NorCal Resist, um, two of which are here for public comment. Um, as a result of the funding by First Five California, these agencies have served over 450 unduplicated families with navigation services, educational workshops, basic needs, mental health assessments, among other supports. The data collected from this pilot year will drive potential opportunities for First Five California to offer future funding. However, the soonest this may be available will be in the next fiscal year. This gap was concerning due to the impact that it will have on the families and the trust that has been built between themselves and these five agencies. We know that these agencies can serve the families in a way that we cannot, not only culturally and linguistically, but also because many of the staff are former refugees themselves. With backfill funding through the Department of Health Services, we can continue to build the relationships that were formed in the first year of investment. We anticipate that with this funding, 270 newcomer families with children zero to five in Sacramento County will be served over the next eight months. Additionally, this funding will expand the target population to asylum seekers. This population was not eligible for the first five California grant, and they are not eligible for 90-day resettlement benefits, putting them at greater need for resources. So we are recommending that to approve a revenue agreement with uh, the Department of Health Services and a second amendment to augment the current contracts with these five agencies to continue to serve more families. Very good, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, any questions of staff before we take public testimony? Commissioner Wirtz? Yes, just clarify for me the asylum seeker range of uh, immigrants that that would uh, cover this this is exciting to hear this because this has been a gap and a uh, inequity that I've really been concerned about so please explain we don't know the number yet because we weren't tracking that in the data however it's from our community partners um, who you may hear from is that has been the constant response on prog progress reports is these are the families mm -hmm. that are living under a bridge who don't have even the food, even food, they are at greater need. So um, so we're glad that with, with this um, grant we can. First Five California, it was not anticipated that <clears throat> this would be a, an issue when the RFA was written, so it only covered for those who, who came through the refugee process, um, refugees, parolees, um, SIVs, and, um, and that was it. So if you didn't come in through that process, they were not eligible. Well, kudos for expanding that. That's fantastic. Right. You never know when an airplane might land in your county with immigrants that desperately need services, right? Or yep. just coming in through any other means mm -hmm. other than the standard way for refugees to enter. Thank you. Other questions by commissioners or comments? Do we have an estimate from the county of the number of refugees, asylum seekers? I've never read one. I'd just be interested to the know. The number of refugees, I want to say we put in our first. 3,000? Uh, yes. 3,000 families? New families, wow. yes. Mm -hmm. But um, we really don't know for asylum seekers. Yeah. So this yeah. will be some of our first data. Thank you. OK. Um, we have members of NorCal Resist that are here that would like to address the commission. Hi there. Um, first, we're going to begin by talking about the impact that the um, First Five grant um, made on some of our families, and then we're also going to talk about the, you know, how excited we are to be um, serving our asylum seeker population. I know there was a question about, um, you know, who these people are, but we, we are currently serving um, our asylum seeker population um, on top of the refugees. Asylum seekers are folks who come through the U.S.-Mexico border and um, um, come without the ability to receive any kind of um, public benefit. Um, so I could understand why data would be lacking um, <laughs> with asylum seekers because they're invisible or they're an invisible population. Um, and we're, the three of us are 
you know, most of the time, the first to meet them um, and help them. Um, we provide, you know, service with basic needs. Um, oftentimes, you know, very direct service, um, very emergent, um, you know, service to this population of people. So I think um, Molly's going to talk a little bit about um, the population, the refugee population who we served, and then um, Katima and I do a lot of um, very direct work with the asylum seekers. So we'd like to talk a little more about that. Hello, salam, hola, Rasvitge. Those are the main languages that are. Uh, clients speak, that's Russian, Spanish, uh, and Pashto. Um, and I'm Molly, I'm one of the navigators who's been able to provide direct services, mainly basic needs through uh, this first five commission contract. Uh, Khatima and Goya um, provide similar services. And we, as people who live and work um, in the communities where these folks are resettling, it's just an incredible opportunity through this program to be able to provide them directly with the services that we that they need. Like we've been able to furnish entire apartments um, through this service. We've been able to connect people with employment because of this service, help them file asylum applications because of this service, help get them to and from appointments, just all of these things that help integrate them into the wider population um, and just make our community stronger and a better place to be. Um, I know we've all been working with these populations for several years, um, and we're very, very familiar with what uh, these folks need. Um, they're not shy about telling us, but we're also uh, happy to serve them however we can. And this, the fact that we can do this on such a grassroots level directly makes a huge impact, that they have someone they can call specifically, not just a general line, but make that particular connection to build that trust is huge. It's, it's, it means absolutely everything. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, so reaching out to the asylum seeker population or actually being able to provide um, more, you know, services to the, these um, very, you know, um, unique and fragile folks um, is going to make a world of a difference, um, you know, for us and for the, the population of people that we serve. Um, these guys, again, um, often, you know, come with without any kind of money, without knowing anybody. Um, they're, they just end up here in, in Sacramento. Um, and sometimes through, you know, the use of the food bank um, or, you know, an asylum, um, sorry, an Afghan market, they end up you know, reaching out to me, who I'm, I'm Goya, and I pick up the main line. Um, so, and then, or Hatima, and, you know, they, they pass on our numbers and find us. I mean, thankfully, right, they find us because we're able to go directly to them and um, assist, um, you know, help. Um, even if it's a temporary, you know, stay in a hotel until we can come up with a better plan between us, you know, um, and, or, you know, get some food. We have a, a, an amazing network in, in NorCal Resist of volunteers. And, I mean, I send out my weekly, you know, um, emails to the group, to our accompaniment group. And sometimes, honestly, it's, you know, daily, if, you know, depending on what they need. But, um, I know that they're not tired of it because I know that the people who have traveled such you know great distances to come here are tired and are in great need. So um, we you know I I take great uh, you know privilege in being able to get a family off the ground you know uh, from living on you know on in the floor you know of of a friend's apartment to being able to put beds um, and clothes, food, toys for children, so um, shoes that actually fit. Um, it, this program is so important, and I'm so excited to be doing this work. Yeah. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. All right. OK. Um, anyone else wish to address the commission on this item? Yes, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ezra. I'm from uh, Sahart Initiative Public Health Institute. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for the great effort. And uh, we have been working with new uh, arrived refugees families uh, last year. And we provided uh, over 500 services to newly arrived refugees family, uh, including basic needs, uh, gift cards with $50, and provide the stroller, car seats. And also, the most important thing we provide. Um, 
We provided educational workshops for uh, newly arrived refugees, which includes uh, issues like uh, women health uh, problems, including uh, cervical cancer screening and breast cancer screening, and also mental health and um, uh, adolescent health as well. So uh, thank you so much, and we're excited to continue working uh, with you and helping a uh, new uh, arrived refugees family. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, seeing no one else that wishes to speak, bring it back to the commission. It is an action item. So I uh, would entertain a motion at this point. Commissioner Mope. Uh, just quickly, I want to say, not knowing exactly how this is going to go, I am so proud that this is something that we are willing to do. Uh, because there was a time I love these moments. There was a time <laughs> when this would have been voted down because of lack of data, um, because maybe the five-year-old is six, um, and just a litany of other stupid reasons why we wouldn't consider helping to support the most vulnerable people in our community when they need it. And so I'm just really super proud that we're in this spot today. So thank you for that. Great comments. Commissioner Wesley. I just want to say as a mom who moved from welfare to work, I always put my lived experience in this space, how the whole child and whole family is being addressed. And I'm actually wanting to know how I can come volunteer and be a support because I wouldn't be sitting here today if whole child and whole family experiences didn't help me. Um, work through my life challenges to getting from pain to promise. So I just want to say thank you and come find you guys so I can see what I can do to come help. And not because I don't have enough to do, but this is the most important thing to do is to be with our families and our communities. I just want to say thank you for your work. Thanks for those comments. Okay. Uh, is there a motion? All right. Chair will move. Look for a second. Second. All right. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll call? Yes, sir. Chair Serna. Aye. Commissioner Wesley. Aye. Commissioner Fernandez E. Garcia. Aye. Commissioner Gordon. Aye. And Commissioner Gross. Aye. And Commissioner Wirtz. Aye. Thank you all. Motion passes. All right. Very good. Can someone beat, beat on the door there? <laughs> Okay, next item, please. Next item, item number nine, nominate and appoint the 2024 sac uh, first five Sacramento vice chair. Okay. Uh, let me ask our executive director if the commission needs to know any uh, critical information about terms or anything like that um, in terms of the uh, pool of candidates that we can or should be considering? Yes, so um, we, did, we did some work on candidates' terms and figuring out when people are going to be moving off the commission because we established the two-term limit of four years each term. So um, we're okay for anybody here today uh, who would like to consider nominating themselves or someone else for this seat. Um, Commissioner Hassett has been holding down the fort for quite some time and is always willing to do it again, but always says, please ask if there's anybody else who is interested <laughs> in this role. So I think we're good to go. Great. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, with that, I would nominate um, Commissioner Hassett. <laughs> <laughs> is there a second? Second. All right. Any other nominations? All right, seeing none, uh, roll call vote, please. Chair Serna. Aye. Commissioner Wesley. Aye. Commissioner Fernandez E. Garcia. Aye. Commissioner Gordon. Aye. Commissioner Casirier. Aye. Commissioner Katari. Aye. And Commissioner Wirtz. Aye. Thank you, motion passes. Congrats, Beth. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Beth, for your service. Thank you. All right, next item, please. Um, item number 10, approve the 2024 meeting calendar. OK. 
Okay, so you have before you the calendar um, and on the flip side, the long range calendar of what we might be discussing at each of those meetings. Um, there is only one change and it's because April 1 um, is actually Cesar Chavez Day and the county has a holiday, but we didn't notice that. <laughs> um, so that meeting for April 1 is actually gonna be April 8. And when we, uh, after approval, we will be sending out later today or tomorrow uh, the calendar invites to get it on your calendars and it will be for April 8. Okay. Any questions of our executive director? Any members of the public wish to address us on this item? No, they do not. Okay. Uh, I will go ahead and move approval of the 2024 meeting calendar with the notation that uh, we will not meet on April 1st, but instead we'll meet on April 8th, 2024. Is there a second? I'll second. I'm fastest to the mic. I'm sorry, who was the second? I'll second. Uh, second by Commissioner Fernandez Z. Garcia. Roll call vote, please. Chair Serna. Aye. Commissioner Wesley. Aye. Commissioner Fernandez E. Garcia. Aye. Commissioner Gordon. Aye. Commissioner Casirier. Aye. Commissioner Katari. Aye. And Commissioner Wirtz. Aye. Thank you all. Motion passes. Very good. All right. Our final item, uh, Commissioner Member comments. Any comments from commissioners? Seeing none. Um, we do have communications that have been filed. And with that, our business is done and we are adjourned.